the Central Weekly, a weekly podcast from the Central Podcast Network. Welcome, Mr. John Henninger. Hey, Jared the Crone. You've got a series within a series within a series, and we're in week three of our series within a series within mm. a series. That's wow. Uh, that's like a trifecta try. That's a lot of something. It's yeah. a lot of threes, which is a holy number. And we're looking at episode number 55 of the Central Weekly. Oh. Gosh, it's crazy. That's a lot of episodes. But we're in week number three, which would be trace for our Spanish-speaking audience. Yeah. Well, that's the only word we're going to use in Spanish. So, uh, But we're looking at... A credible account. A credible week account. three. Yep. Jesus miracles. Right, that's right. This weekend we're talking about Jesus miracles, and that's right. This weekend we're talking about Jesus miracles. We're recording this on a Wednesday prior to the weekend, so we're going to give this a ride here. See how we're going to do without me knowing nothing about the sermon. Wow. <laughs> Buckle up, ladies and really gentlemen. Really sold this episode well, Jared. <laughs> they have turned it off. Uh-huh. But here's the thing. Here's the reason you can't turn it off. Later on in our episode, because it's a series within a series within a series, mm. we're looking at the mission work of Earl Hobner, his wife, Ruth Ann, mm. and Central Brazil Mission. Yeah. It's going to be a good episode. Gosh, Earl is 81 years old. Wow. Which is crazy. And he has a mind like a... 80 year old <laughs> wow no he's he was spitting out dates in our in our discussion in our yeah. conversation just like they were yesterday mm. and it's amazing I, I, I tell them I tell him this it's amazing the sheer scale of what God has accomplished through this man's life yeah. and through city ministries uh, and then through the village and of course a lot of people know a lot about what he's done along the Amazon River with the boat ministry the medical boat right yeah and it's a great 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 endearing uh, conversation mm. with Earl. Uh, he speaks. He's comes live, or well, not live. We recorded it live, and you're going to hear it from his home office in Springfield, Ohio. That's their home base now, mm. um, and it's just a, it's a really good conversation, that's and cool. I'm excited. He shares some. He just drops a lot of knowledge, and for a man that's been doing it for sixty plus seventy, almost seventy years, it's just again amazing the scale. But yet he shares these small intimate stories mm. about how God has provided and how God has seen them through. Gosh. For, for so many years. Super cool. So we're Earl excited Hobner. about that. Seven or Brazil if mission. you're, again, our uh, Portuguese or Spanish-speaking audience, Pastor Francisco. Oh. You like that accent? I do, that yeah. good. I know. So, he, Yes, his middle name is Francisco. He'll, he'll tell this. <laughs> okay, all right. They can't say Earl okay. in Portuguese. Uh-huh. So they say his middle name, which is Francis, and they call him Pastor that ma- Francisco. That makes more sense, yeah. Yeah, you like that. Sure, yeah, that's good. But at the very end, he's going to share even what God is doing currently in his ministry, some brand new things, even mm. at 81 years old. Very cool. And it's super cool. So, yeah. uh, it's go- I mean, it's going to get a little confusing because it's Central Brazil Mission from Central Christian Church, but yeah. everything's central here. Yeah, very good. Like nice. the Bible. Nice. Yeah, nice. Okay, so John, here we go. All right, before we get into it, oh, oh, if you oh, were going to guess, what... Oh, what listen, I haven't seen. Listen up, everybody. All right, listen. Mm-hmm. What oh. flavor did that sound like to you? Very tropical. Mm-hmm. I have seen green and red, yeah, so yeah. I'll be honest okay. about that. All right. Um, I'm gonna say kiwi, Ooh. strawberry. Okay, lime and watermelon. <sighs> Man, your colors were on. I'm gonna go. Your colors were right. You finished this episode, yeah. John. <laughs> but I think a lot of people out there knew that. They knew. <laughs> They could. Hear they were it. screaming through their ear at their ear. It was lime and watermelon. Yeah. They were so frustrated. They were frustrated. All right. So hey, this let's weekend, talk yeah, about Jesus miracles. Yeah. This weekend we're talking about Jesus miracles. Uh, and like, this should really be a credible. This should be credible accounts. Credible. Yeah. I mean, it is fa- all. All of these. <laughs> yeah. Sure. All of these are found in the credible account, which is of course scripture. Um, and um, yeah. So all that's found, all this is found in scripture, so we know that it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, started off talking about magic, Jared. Yep. Talk about um, uh, you. This, this is ahead of the weekend, so you don't know. Yep. We, have, we haven't I, seen. But uh, you know, like the the napkin thing that I do with the fork behind the napkin. You do that. I'm doing that. Oh gosh. On stage. <laughs> yeah. Mind. Wow. Blown. Wow. Right. The two year olds are gonna love that. <laughs> but the but the point is you t- 
turn it around, you look behind the curtain mm-hmm. on our kind of magic stuff, mm-hmm. and you see that all of uh, like all of what we interpret as unbelievable all, is always explainable. You turn, yeah. you, you know, you look on the other side of the curtain; it's always explainable. In the Christian world, we like to call it an illusion, John. Yeah, sure, right, <laughs> great. <laughs> First, <laughs> I'm going to the homeschool convention. You look I gotta be the, ready. You look behind the curtain, and you you realize that it is uh, all explainable. Jesus, in part, became known because of these wondrous mm-hmm. works that he was doing. Mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. Um, But there were some people, uh, as you know, acted like um, Jesus kind of had this novelty act power that he could use, uh, you know, like that he needed to use to um, validate his position, right? Uh, In Matthew 16, 1, one day the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. That's not how it works. That's not how miracles worked then. That's mm-hmm. not how miracles work now. We cannot demand the move of God. Yeah. What? We can't do it. I mean, no. like, we have authority through Christ, but we don't demand he moves. His, this is where I end up the sermon. This, this is where the sermon ends up, but basically, oh, he has a that's history. A quick conversation. He, <laughs> so he, he has a history of moving in response to the faith of people. Yeah. Right? And, but yeah. It, it is not at all because of our demand. So, anyways, yeah. uh, just to give you a, a little breakdown on the rest of the sermon, um, yeah, like the disciple John, right? Mm-hmm. When he was writing his, when he wrote, um, uh, of course, John, the gospel, um, he ended his writing. He could have said a million different things, but basically what he said was, this book only contains a small mm. portion of what Jesus did. Mm-hmm. We, you know, if, if I were to write down everything that he did, mm-hmm. I, would, I would assume that it would, con- it would fill up all the books ever written mm-hmm. in the world, right? I mean, and so we know that not all of the miracles Jesus did were recorded in Scripture, yeah. but... What was recorded was recorded for a purpose. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's because different people can connect with different things, right? Mm-hmm. Like I see something different in one thing, you see it mm-hmm. in another, but it connects to our life in a different kind of a way. Yeah. And so of all the things that Jesus did, right? I mean, he raised people from the dead. He heals lepers. He controls the weather. He tells a crippled man to walk. He makes a coin appear in the mouth of a fish. He casts out demons, restores sight, regenerates a cut off ear off of a guy in the garden of the Gethsemane, right? Um, feeds thousands of people with very little resources. And the list goes on and on and on. 38 times in scripture, at least we see um, Jesus perform some sort of physical miracle that was recorded in the gospels. All of them amazing. All of them completely true. Why, Jared? because they're found in a credible account great job buddy um and so anyways talk about talk about some of those kind of kind of miracles um and then okay so i asked people like what is what do you have a favorite miracle i mean there's all these miracles jared do you have a favorite miracle a miracle that speaks to you that I, really connects with your heart well i'm fresh off the chosen Mm. And that episode, uh, sh- spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> season three, episode eight is the walking on the water. Mm-hmm. And to me that, and I preached on that a little bit this mm-hmm. summer, last summer, and it's just, it's a big moment, but it's an intimate moment with Peter and mm-hmm. Peter's who I identify with most. So yeah, mm-hmm. I think walking on the water plus the Peter moment. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you could say, I think that's one in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really good. Yours? What about, what do did well, you, yeah. so I'm talking about one, and I, I had seen a video a couple of weeks ago. Actually, Adrian Lyde shared this video, and I was oh. like, that, that's really insightful. And so uh-huh. just digging into that a little bit more. Um, there is this miracle recorded in Scripture that, to be totally honest, I'm just kind of glazed over for the hmm. most part. You know, like, well, I mean. Krispy creamed it. Krispy creamed it, right. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um <laughs> So I just kind of, kind of, kind of just, and not looked over. It's amazing, but I mean, there's far more uh, incredible things, right? Yeah. I mean, like raising people from the dead. Yeah, that's a like, big one. Right? I mean, these are these are huge deals. But um, so Jesus' very first public miracle, which is uh, the water turned water to wine, turning water into wine, the right. wedding of Cana. In right. Cana. Very good. And so we we I read this scripture from John chapter two, uh-huh. um, and I talked about how I mean like I've always thought this is like a little side note. I always thought it was remarkable how I mean here is Jesus Christ, the Creator of yeah. the universe in human flesh, sent on a divine mission to Earth. I mean like 
superior divinity. Yeah, you know, I mean, like all of these things, right? And the reason he does his first miracle is to make his mom happy. Is because his mom told him to. <laughs> it's not because like my time has arrived now. I'm he didn't even announce. wanted to do no, it. No, he didn't even want to do it. And then he says, "Woman, why do you involve me in yeah. this? Like, uh, this is first of all for the king of the universe to call his mom woman. I think I would never do that. <laughs> but again, he's the king of the universe. Mm-hmm. He can do whatever he wants. But can you imagine if you if if uh, if little uh, little Mama Henninger mm-hmm. came in and said? Please do this for me, little mm-hmm. John. Yeah. And you go, woman. <laughs> woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> so so anyway, I mean that's that's a little side note. But yeah. Um, so I, I feel like there is reason for us to be inspired by this miracle. And we can learn from this miracle. Um, maybe more, maybe more than some of the others. Like, mm-hmm. of course, it's cool, mm-hmm. but is there more to it? And Jared, I think there is. Oh, my gosh. The people know, and I don't. I this know, is what's fascinating know. They've about are, they've this already heard, They've already heard yeah. this whole sermon. But, okay, so here's, here's the difference, right? When Jesus heals the sick mm-hmm. and restores the cripple and he raises the dead to life, right? He's returning something mm. that was... Mm-hmm. Kind of once already there. Mm-hmm. The ingredients are there. He's just rearranging Putting it back or the place it was intended. reviving, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, one or the other. Jesus feeds the five thousand. It starts with the five loaves of bread and the two fish. It he multiplies mm-hmm. what's already, already there. there. But what you need to make wine is not found in water. The chemical properties are different. The ingredients are different. Like you can mix it, shake it, let it sit, let it ferment, whatever. You will never get wine out of just water. So in his very first public miracle, is it possible that Jesus is showing that this is who he truly is? Like he Mm -hmm. is the same God with the same power that he's always had with the wine at the wedding at Cana. He's the same creator that he was at creation. Mm -hmm. You know, like he's bringing things, Mm -hmm. he's making new things out of nothing. Like Mm -hmm. he brings things out of the ingredients aren't there. The, Mm -hmm. the, the mix isn't there. Um, I uh, said, I said in the sermon, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't need the mix to make the meal. He's a from scratch God. He doesn't even need the recipe. Mm-hmm. He's writing the book, yeah. basically. It's um, not like he's got Kool Aid packets and just sprinkle a little thing. Just and boom, wine. Ta da! No, uh, but um, so that's that's the gist of the message yeah. is that we should be encouraged by this miracle very specifically because you need to know if you're in a place where you're asking for a miracle, you're you're asking mm-hmm. God to work, whatever it is, He mm-hmm. is able and mm-hmm. sometimes that means i mean sometimes he uses something that is existing like the bread and the fish other times he creates something incredible out of nothing at all mm-hmm. and so that's kind of that that's that is the sermon in a net nut shell in a in a wine jar nice yeah that holds 20 to 30 gallons <laughs> that's a big that's a huge jar, yeah. that's, i would hate to be the guy that has to lug those around mm-hmm. but here's the thing i've been looking at the gospel of john lately too and it's neat that you mentioned that because you're talking about his miracles and they're big, like fitting the 5,000, but they're small too with a lot of times he's saying, hey, don't tell anybody after mm-hmm. he heals them. Yeah. I'm amazed, and I think it was a commentator I was reading, at all of the stories, most of the, if you look at through this lens, read the book of John okay. and you look through all those miracles, okay. God is a God of abundance. Mm-hmm. And it's not like he just does just enough to get by. Feeding the 5,000, they had plenty left over. The wine, it was the best wine even before the wine at the mm-hmm. beginning. And and if you look at the very end, what was the very end again? I don't know what we're talking about. Remember, the, tell me what happened. The very the end, end of the of the scripture yeah. of John? Yep. He says, like, if of all of these things, mm-hmm. like all these things that we talked about, there's a bajillion more. Abundance. Yeah. And I just think if we can grasp that, mm-hmm. we can when we come to God with our small things, we know that he could answer that and he could do it abundantly. Mm-hmm. And I think too, going into this Easter season of, hey, I might have been in the fire, I might have gone through a sea and seen you work miracles, but I'm still exhausted and mm-hmm. I still need your touch, God. This can be a, a good reminder that not only is he gonna bring life, he's gonna bring it to the full. full. Boom. Mm, that's, that's good. Right. That's right. Thanks. Nice job. <laughs> appreciate it. Seriously. That's all, that's sure. all I got. Really but good. that's really good. So our little doorway picture was mm-hmm. feeding of the 5,000, but really it should have been the wedding at Cana. 
Yeah, probably so. Good to know. But I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> both of them are true. You know, but, I, mean, yes. I, I mean, both of them are part of the story. Mm-hmm. You know, God, sometimes Jesus uses what we have yeah. available, but I don't think that we should be discouraged if we don't have anything available. That's good. Uh, at, at, at the end of the sermon, mm-hmm. um, basically, that that's what I said. I'm just trying to find here. So, He's able to use something existing, but God can also change the situation. Um, I read, you know, Luke one thirty seven. With God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. Genesis eighteen is anything too hard for the Lord. Matthew nineteen. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So sometimes when we ask for a miracle, yeah, what we're seeking is the restoration of something that once was there. Yeah, um, as broken as it might be, mm-hmm. there are still pieces that exist of it, mm-hmm. and we just need him to put it back together or yeah. make it better than what it was. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a fractured friendship. Maybe it is a relationship with your kids that was good at one point, but then they've grown up and you guys have grown apart. And yeah. like it seems impossible, but you're asking God for a return mm-hmm. in that. Maybe it's a marriage uh, that mm-hmm. was healthy at one point. There was passion there at one point, but now it's gone. And it needs. A miracle. Maybe it's maybe you're fighting for your family line. Maybe you are fighting for what God has for the future of your family line. And you you know that like there's my grandma, my great grandma, whoever it is, you know there's a history of good and godly people in your family line. Mm-hmm. So you're asking God to kind of restore that in the here and now and in the future. And his miracles remind us that he can take those pieces and make a masterpiece, but sometimes there are no pieces. Sometimes you mm-hmm. feel like I don't have anything good in my bloodline. Yeah. My family name has been defined by disappointment and disgrace. There's a long line of addiction that's never been overcome, anger that's never been controlled, abuse that's never been addressed. And you say, God, I've got nothing to offer. My hands are completely yeah. empty. I don't have the ingredients for success or the pieces to put in your hands for you yeah. to put back together. Yeah. But this credible account should encourage us in the fact that he doesn't need any of that stuff yeah. that he doesn't move on our demand, but he moves by the faith of his people. And so, um, at the end of the sermon, I just encourage people yeah. to pray with faith that God can move in their circumstance and can provide a yeah. miracle no matter what their present yeah. circumstance looks like. What's our final song this weekend? I think we're doing two. Um, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's Waymaker, and I've witnessed it yeah. maybe. Of witness it, yeah. I believe so. Gratitude has been a big mind. I've talked to you about it before, yeah. but and, and that's that's a song right there where he, he, at the beginning of that song he just feels completely empty mm. and he's got nothing left to mm-hmm. give. Mm-hmm. And I think we've all felt that. I know I felt that way a lot, and that's why that song has meant a lot to me this past like two years. Yeah, just because when you're in the midst of so much brokenness, I like the word I was using two years ago was I just felt shattered mm. and shattered. When you've, you're shattered, you can't put those pieces back together. Right. At least you in can. our yes, we I can. can't. Right. And that's just the way I felt for so long. I felt like that I just felt empty and mm. shattered, and mm. the things that I kept trying to do were not working. Yeah. But yet, God is still going to lift my head up mm-hmm. and say, "No, you don't need to bow." I mean, there's you don't need to you know cower at my feet any longer. You are my son. I mm-hmm. want you to stand up and rise with me. Mm. And I think that is so right on with those mm-hmm. miracles, especially the miracle at Cana, that yeah. he can make something that is not there. Right. He can bring about brand new life. Right. And that's good. That we all need to hear that. Praise God. That's good. Next week. Next week, similarly. <laughs> you're back at to the jar. jars, baby. <laughs> Um, next Liquid week, and jar. we're talking a little bit about the abundance, um, yeah. but we're talking about uh, kind of this um, this lie that we all buy into that um, God is a God of limited resources. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'll tell a story about myself and the way that um, you know I've kind of was faced with this decision mm-hmm. at one point, um, like, do I believe that or do I not? Mm-hmm. And then, uh, but anyways, that's what we're talking about next week. It's going to be good. It's just, this is just ramping up. James last week did such a good job. Again, that horrible joke at the beginning. I apologize. <laughs> Come but, on now. But I think it was, it was kind of funny. Yeah. I think I, I loved that 11 o'clock he did the little tally mark. <laughs> he did that. That was he, added to, just for 11 o'clock audience. Yeah. That was good. Mm. I'm excited to see James. what you might do this weekend because mm-hmm. I don't know the audience. You made a suggestion. The, I did. <laughs> you I did. did. We'll see what happens. But here's Here's the thing, what's going to happen next on the Central Weekly, we're going to look at the life of Earl Hobner and Central uh, Brazil Mission. And just again, I, you'll be inspired by what he says. This is one thing that he's going to say, and I'm going to ruin it. I'm, spoiler alert. Do it. He says, once you see God work, 
you get courageous. Mm. And his life is full of that statement, how he saw God work and he said, hey, I'm going to ask for more and I'm going to just follow his lead in everything I do. And he's multiplying disciples. He's going to throw some numbers out there about what he's seen and it's, it's pretty cool. So don't go anywhere. Our conversation with Earl and Central Brazil Mission is right after this. Thanks, John. And we're back with the Central Weekly, and we're super excited for a guest that is near and dear to many people at Central Christian Church in Mount Vernon, uh, a ministry that Central has supported for quite a long time. And really, I'm excited about this conversation because I'm excited to learn more about Brazil Central Mission. And this is going to be a hard conversation because we're going to use the word Central a lot, and I don't want people to get it confused. So, Earl Hobner, welcome to the Central Weekly Podcast. We are so grateful to have you. We are glad to be here. Thank you. So, Earl, we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about Ruth Ann, and we want to talk about your mission, Central Brazil Mission, because this is the third week, I'm going to say it, the third week of our series uh, of A Credible Account here at Central, where we're talking about these incredible Bible stories. But I think it'd be super cool, and I hopefully it has been for the people listening the last two weeks, to tell the stories of missionaries, the people that Central supports, uh, the people that are doing these great things here and now, and have these incredible stories to tell. So, Earl, I'm excited to, again to have you on the podcast because we've I've seen each other. We've talked before. I know we had some time when we had the golf scramble, uh, but really hadn't had a chance to have a, a, a conversation. So I'm excited about this. Okay. So, Earl, you are where at right now? Where are you at in your office? In Goiânia. No, I'm in Springfield, Ohio right Springfield, now. Springfield, Ohio. Okay. I thought we weren't having an international <laughs> Zoom call. But yeah, I, that is, so Springfield is your home, your uh, U.S. home base. It is now. Right. We moved here last year after being in Brazil for 53 years. Uh huh. And so I'm excited to talk more about that. But I want in case people don't know who you are, let's do our what we like to call rapid fire on the Central Weekly, an icebreaker to get to know you, Earl Hobner. OK, are you ready, Earl? Well, I am ready. OK, Earl, here we go. Favorite food. Uh, Big Mac. A Big Mac. Okay. Uh, favorite vacation spot? Probably on the river. Okay. And could I ask which river? The Amazon. Okay. I was going to, because Springfield, we're talking about what river goes through Springfield, Missouri now. There's none. Ohio, the Ohio River so close. Ohio, Springfield, Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Springfield, person, Ohio. Person in the Bible that you identify with most? Uh, the Apostle Paul. Okay. Uh, you get a day to yourself, Earl. What do you do? Well, I usually have to get in my running because I okay. run six days a week. So, okay. Oh, I'm excited. We'll talk more about your uh, Earl the runner. Yeah, I have run a thousand miles a year for 50 some years. Wow, Earl, that's exciting. Congra I think that's a congratulations right there. Earl, yeah. uh, what's your f uh, biggest fear? Well, it would probably be now with the work on the Amazon is to have trouble with the boat. Uh huh. Have an accident or something with the boat. Yeah, yeah. We, we, and so, pray about that. What is your favorite thing? Your favorite memory that you can say this is on the top of my list with Central or Brazil Central Mission? Probably when we took the the challenge to build the new boat. Okay. That was because we had had the older boat for from 2000, uh, March of 2000 until 2012, and then we wow. built the new boat. That was the big challenge. 2012, that happened. Yeah, that we inaugurated in January of 2012. It took two and a half years to build it. Okay, okay. Well, here we so go. That, Earl, you're off the hot seat now. Good job. You did a good job with rapid fire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> here's the thing a lot of people are maybe thinking okay who is this guy because i've heard of maybe heard of brazil central mission and i've heard that central supports this riverboat but i'm excited to get more to know you earl get to know your family how your sons and your daughters are now helping with the mission uh so earl let's go from the kind of the beginning where did you grow up and uh how did your faith play a role in growing up Okay, we grew up, Ruth Ann and I both, Ruth Ann was a farm girl, mm -hmm. we had studied, we were in the first grade together. Oh yeah? In, in Georgetown, Ohio. Okay. 
That is about 50 miles east of Cincinnati. So we were uh, Reds fans. Uh -huh. uh, one of my first jobs was delivering newspapers, the Cincinnati Inquirer, every morning. Uh -huh. And then I don't know how many years, because I got new customers, was able to go to opening day for oh. the Reds games. So we grew up there and grew up in, in the church, the, the Church of Christ in Georgetown. Huh? And then as we grew up, I remember one one time it was a Christmas Eve, we were out caroling. And the, one of the preachers and the youth minister, who was a good friend of ours, said, Earl, why don't you go to the Bible college? Why don't you go to Cincinnati and go to Bible college? And I thought, well, you're crazy. I'm not, I'm, I'm not called to go to Bible college and then nothing. Well, it ended up that, that I went. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had three little kids. Ruth Ann worked to support me, and the church there supported. So we were, we went went to Bible college. And so that and is, then, I was going to stop you there because that's something we share in common. Is Cincinnati for me Christian college or yeah. Christian university? R.I.P. Oh. Though I, I feel uh, I, it, it's sensitive to talk about with me. It's like a lo lo losing a loved one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's where I went. Georgetown, you said, was about how close to Cincinnati? It's 50 miles east okay. of Cincinnati. Yeah. Yes. It's 12 miles north of the river. Yes. I think I've been through there before. I went to visit a church a little farther away down because we kind of took that river, scenic river route before. Right. In college years did a pre. Uh, I can't remember the name of the church, though. But what well, year did you guys graduate? Graduated in 68. Okay. Did you, did you coincide any with Randy Sales? Randy Velps. Randy Sells. I know he was there, but he might have been a little later or before. I can't remember. Oh no, I, I no, I didn't know. I didn't know Randy until we went to to Central. Okay. Yeah. So I'll share Cincinnati Christian College or Cincinnati Bible College together. That's yeah, what that's it. what it was called, CBS. Uh huh. So okay, you. So I, I started preaching. I had a part time job, and I preached to the, the little church there in the, the county where we grew up. And uh, then we had one of our, one of the ministers was at Georgetown, the youth minister. He came to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And so at one time, there were six of us, three couples of us. We all grew up in Brown County. Okay. And we ended up as missionaries in Brazil. Okay. But Lynn and Julie Cleveland were there, and they said, well, why don't you come and work with us? Mm -hmm. Well, I had never thought too much about missions. Uh, the little church that I was preaching at was, was growing. And so we went to Lake James School of Missions one year to learn how to inform our church about missions. Yeah. Well, the next year, we went back to the School of Missions as recruits that were preparing to go to Brazil. Okay. But at that time, back in the, the 60s, the Christian Church, Church of Christ, they were sending out a lot of missionaries. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these Guys that were recruits have been recruits for four or five years, and you live in a car, you travel with your family, and it's a hard life. Well, Ruth Ann and I decided, okay, we'll, we'll go to Brazil if that's where God wants us. Yeah. But I decided I'm, I wasn't going to put my family through that. Uh -huh. So I said, uh, okay, God, here's the way it is. You've got two years, mm -hmm. and if we don't have the support we need in two years, that means we don't have the calling to go to Brazil. Well, 18 months later, we were in language school in Campinas, Sao Paulo, studying Portuguese. There you go. And so God has taken care of us mm -hmm. ever since then. He's, he's led us. He showed us, you know, what to do. I mean, um, I remember one of our first experiences was on our first term. Our support was about $1,200 a month mm -hmm. back then. And we got a letter from a church that we had helped develop their faith promise. Oh. Down near Paris, Kentucky, uh -huh. and of of, of our twelve hundred support, they were giving us four hundred. So one day we get a letter from the church said they were having trouble that they couldn't support us anymore. This would be the last month they would support us. Well, what are we going to do? We're in Brazil and they're in Kentucky, and we're losing a third of our support. Yeah. Well, the same month we got a letter from a church that we had not been to before we came to Brazil. And they had decided that starting next month, they're going to support us $400 a month. Hmm. So we, we learned then that, that God is in control. Yeah. 
So we never worried about, we, we always try to do a good job at letting people know how, how their money's being spent about our support. But I've never really worried about support because I know that God will provide yeah. what we need to do what he wants to do through us. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up after language school, we spent, uh, we studied Portuguese six hours a day, five days a week for one year. Wow. That's all we did. There were 25 other couples of us and two single gals in, the, in our group in language school. Well, of those today, we and one other couple that I know of are the only ones still serving in Brazil. Really? But that, that was over 50 years ago. Where did, that, where did this language school, where did that take place? It was in Campinas, Sao Paulo. It's about 100 kilometers, 60 miles out of Sao Paulo. So you're, get, you're getting so, to, while you're studying this for a year, you're getting hands-on because you're in the streets, you're being able to talk with people. Right, that's all we did. We just con- we didn't do anything else. We didn't do any kind of mission work. Mm-hmm. You know, you think you're going to have to win the world the first year. Well, you don't. If you don't learn their language, you're not going to be good at it. So we spent that year in language school, and then we decided to work with another couple that had been in, on missionaries for a number of years in Brazil, and we worked with them kind of an intern our first uh, few years in Brazil. And so with them, we started a new church in a little town outside of Goiânia. Mm-hmm. And then I became the uh, director of tea training, which was theological education by extension. Okay. And so I would travel to the churches and we would train people in the churches, a uh, 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 basic Bible course. Yeah. But we were living in... Uh, almost two hours from where most of our churches were. So we ended up moving to Goiânia. Uh Goiânia was the capital of the state of Goiás, still is. Uh And at that time, when we moved to Goiânia, there were probably 350,000 people that live in Goiânia. Okay. That live in the city. Now, now there's one and a half million people that live in Goiânia. Wow. And so we, we decided then, to, to move to Goiânia. So we moved to Goiânia in uh, 1972. Okay. And then there was a new new subdivision going in, the New Horizons, Novo Horizonte, New Horizons subdivision, the government housing going in. And uh, I was the head of the, the Bible Institute. We were training and st- preparing uh, Brazilian young men and some, some girls for ministry. And then one day, some another missionary walked in my office. He said, Hobner, what are you doing in here? You need to go out there and start a church. Mm-hmm. And I almost told him because he was in the printing ministry. I said, well, why don't you leave the print shop? And why don't you go start a church? But I didn't. <laughs> and then I had another missionary come in. He said, Hobner, you don't want to start a church out there because government housing is going to okay. be poor people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wouldn't do it. Well, we, we, we decided we were going to do it. Mm-hmm. So we went to this new subdivision, and it was an area of about four city blocks. There were to be 15,000 people live in this area. Wow. It was just house wall, house wall, and then a wall behind another house and all that. So we ended up buying the rights to one of these houses, huh. and the whole house was was not very big. Huh. And so we took out the bathroom, and so we had the, the little living room, the bathroom, and the kitchen as the auditorium. And oh. then the two or three little bedrooms for classrooms. And that's how we started. We started the church in March of 1974. In fact, they're celebrating next week, 49 years. That's exciting. At the New Horizonte Church. Yeah. Okay. So we started that church in March of 74. 75, we came back to the United States on furlough. Uh-huh. And we had our fourth child because we had three when we went to Brazil. And then we planned Teddy to be born in Brazil so we wouldn't have to worry about all kinds of documents if he was a Brazilian and American and all that. So he, he was an American. So, yeah. And then the church started to grow a little bit. We had about 100 members. And then in, in 1979, we had a church growth conference with Donna McGavern. Donna McGavern was the founder of the church growth movement. 
Uh-huh. And he came to Brazil. It's probably one of the last seminars that he had with Peter Wagner. Yeah. And we sat under we sat under those two men, all the missionaries, and there was a lot of missionaries then. And I remember Dr. McGavern asked us when we, we first started the week, he said, Where do you want to be ten years from now? Well, I had never never thought about it. 10 years from now, he said, you need to set goals. You need to dream, have a vision of what God might want to do with your life. Mm-hmm. So that changed my life. Ephesians 3.20, where it says that God can do more than you think or imagine according to his power that is at work in you. Mm-hmm. And so I went back and in, in early of 19. Well, late of 1979, we set goals in the one church. We set 10-year goals for mm-hmm. 2000, for uh, 1980, and then we would set goals in 1980 for 1990. So we set goals for 1980. How many churches we wanted, how many Christians we wanted. And so we developed our mission statement then, make disciples, make better disciples, you'll make more disciples. Mm-hmm. Based on Matthew 28 and Ephesians 4, where my job is to perfect the saints for the ministry and the best ministry is making disciples. So we started training young men. We had Bible Institute program and started training these for, for churches. Well, when 1980 came 10 years later, we had surpassed Hmm. the goals for how many churches we wanted for how many Christians we wanted and then in 1980, we set goals for 1990. When that happened, we surpassed all those goals. So, in the when we, we when I first stopped and calculated, in, in when we had completed 40 years in Brazil, we had baptized over 40,000 people, and we had started from that one little church between 80 to 100 churches. And so, all of those churches have become and had at that time become self-supporting. They were on their own. And so the Brazilian church in the 80s became a missionary church. Uh A lot of missionaries were sent out from Brazil to to other countries. There are probably more Brazilian missionaries in in other countries than Americans. And we have missionaries, Brazilian missionaries in the five Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa and Brazilian missionaries all over. Well, in October of, of... 84, we had a church, we had a, a mission emphasis week at Novo Design, a month, a month of missions. And we prayed and we fasted and we said, oh God, we want to become a missionary church as well. Yeah. Well, one week went by and two weeks went by and three weeks went by. And the end of the, the beginning of the fourth week, I got a call from a guy that had known me from Goiânia. He was single at the time, but he had married now an Argentina gal. They were in Manaus. Well, I knew nothing about Manaus. I knew Manaus was the capital of the state of Amazonas. Uh And the only thing I really knew about Manaus was one day we used to fly, when we'd come back to the States, we would fly from Goiânia to Brasilia, to Manaus, to Caracas, to get to Miami. Mm-hmm. That was our flight schedule. Mm-hmm. And on one of these flights, we were in Manaus. It was about six o'clock in the morning and people getting off on and off the plane. And I just stepped off the back of the plane to thought I'd, you know, have a breath of fresh air. <laughs> and it was probably a hundred degrees. The humidity was probably the same. And I thought to myself, who in the world would ever want to live there? Well, never let God even know you think things like that because it ended up that after that this was in october we would have the missionary conference and this guy said well i have a little church here and i married an argentina gal and we're going to argentina and, and i've talked to him and they want you to come and take over this church here oh well this was in october i said well give us to the end of the year see if we can raise enough money to send a couple to take over this little church in my house well when the end of the year came it wasn't wasn't who was going to Manaus, it was which of three couples. Mm. So we ended up sending one of these couples, and I remember January 25th, 1995, I threw the, flew to Manaus with this 
a young couple and their three kids, and we took over this little work in Manaus. It's the capital of the state of Amazonas. Okay, yep. And so in the Amazon, there are no, there are no roads. There are only rivers. Mm -hmm. There's no, no other way to travel. So when you live in, in a certain town, you travel by ferry boat back and forth to Manaus to get, get your supplies because man, Manaus is the, the main city in the Amazon. And so after a year or two, the, the church of Manaus started another church downriver in the, in the little town of Urucara. And so the preacher there, of course, going back and forth to Manaus, he, he knew the guy that ran the, the ferry boat. Mm -hmm. So this is October now of 98. Okay. And the preacher there says, uh, Pastor Francisco, and that's my name in Brazil. Mm -hmm. the Brazilians cannot say Earl. And so I'm, my middle name is Francis, so they call me Pastor Francisco. Yep. So he calls it, he says, Pastor Francisco, he said, if we're going to have a good work in the Amazon, uh, we need a boat. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, let's pray. Who knows? Maybe God wants us to have a boat. Well, going back to the, the missionary conference, I guess what had happened, because all the churches that we had started in around Goiânia, and they were multiplying and starting more churches, I, I guess God decided, well, Hobner, what are you doing here? They don't need, they don't need you here anymore. Mm. So that's, and it was interesting because, you know, I, I worked myself out of a job and the churches were growing and yeah. I, I wonder what I was, you know, what am I going to do? So God says, well, you better go to Manaus, I guess. Uh -huh. And so we ended up having this family go to Manaus. He says, we need a boat. And so in October of 98, we were in Manaus. Uh, the preacher and I, and we were looking around, what's it going to cost to to build a boat, mm -hmm. uh, to buy a boat that we could help the people to live along the river? Mm -hmm. And so it was about, I don't know, $50,000. Mm -hmm. But there was a guy there that, that run the ferry boat between Urukara and Manaus mm -hmm. that heard about our project. And so he said, he said, uh, Senior Aldo Vado wants to talk to us. Let's go down to the boat. We'll go down to his boat, and he wants to talk. So we went down the boat, and he showed me a picture of this kind of a yacht that he had that he used once a month maybe with his family. And he said, you know, I, I'd like to help you guys with your mission, and, and I'll sell this boat to you. And all I want is 120000 hey ice Brazilian money, which at that time was $110,000. Well, I just kind of forgot it and put the picture of the, the boat in my agenda and we came back to the States. Well, in December of 98, the mission board approved the project that I could raise funds for the boat in the Amazon. Okay. So we're on furlough in 1999 and going church to church and uh, preaching, presenting our work. And we had been at Mandarin Christian Church in Jacksonville, Florida. When they first started, they ran about 175. And Dennis Bratton was the preacher. Dennis and I had, had gone to Bible college together. Uh, his dad had been an elder in the church that sent us to Brazil back in, in 1969. Uh -huh. So Dennis and I were good friends. And wherever Dennis preached, that church supported us. In fact, this church in Springfield, Illinois, the late lakeside church yeah. was one of our supporting churches there in uh in illinois and so now it's it's march of 99 and i'm to speak at mandarin and they're now in a 14 million dollar building program and i am there to raise money for missions mm -hmm. well dennis and i being good friends i i didn't want to cause problems in the church so i decided i had to preach for four times, I had four services, about 800 people in each time. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to cause problems in church. So I'm not going to, uh, uh, even though I'm here to raise money for missions, I'm not going to talk about money. Uh -huh. in, my, in my sermon, I talked about a vision to have a boat to work in the Amazon. Yeah. And so in between one of these services, after the, the one of the services, people, 800 people in and out, then another service in between one of these services, this gentleman walks up to me. Now I want you to get me in to get the story. This gentleman is not a member of the church there. He just happens to be there the day that I preach because hmm. daughter is a member there. Mm -hmm. And so he comes up to me after between one of the services, he said, no, nah, I just heard you preach about a, 
the vision have a boat in the Amazon. He said, my wife and I, we, we help with projects sometime and we go half on a project. How much is this boat going to cost? Mm -hmm. I said about $50,000. Well, by then, see, when we had our trustees meeting back in December, the trustees had come up with about $15,000 just from the churches they supported. So we were working on our $50,000 goal. Well, I said, look, look, I, I don't, I don't know. He, he called his wife over and he said, Barbara, you just heard the guy preach and they need $50,000 to build a boat. Don't you think we could get half of that? And I thought, look, you better talk to the dentist because I'm not here to cause problems. I didn't know he wasn't a member of the church. I said, he, he, I don't want to cause problems in the church. You, you better talk to Dennis because, you know, it scared me because I, I didn't know what to do really. Yeah. And then, well, Three weeks later, we get a check for $25,000 from Bill Crawford. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to jump from March of 99 to 2013 and 2014. Mm -hmm. We're now on the boat in the Amazon. We have surgeons from Mayo Clinic that come to do surgeries in the little hospitals that we work at because Bill Crawford goes to the doctor at Mayo Clinic and he talks about the boat in the Amazon. Yeah, I mean it's it's amazing how yeah. how it worked out. But then when when he said, I said, well, Bill, if you're gonna you're gonna support us, you're gonna have to come on a trip. So the next year, he came on one of the trips on on the boat. And when he had said that him and that him and his wife had helped half on a project, he was good friends with Bill Bright who did the Jesus film. Okay. So you can kind of figure that Bill probably helped quite a bit with the Jesus film. He was, Bill was a member of the, of the first Baptist church, downtown Jacksonville. Okay. And, uh, but he's been there a couple of other times and he's 95 now and he's wanting to come again, but I, I don't think he'll ever make it to Brazil again. Yeah. But anyway, what, what a what a neat story of I mean that's one thing about listening the last three weeks to missionaries God provides when he every time oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so now we have almost the the fifty thousand uh dollars -huh. so I called Pastor Gerald the, the the preacher in Manaus and I said Pastor Gerald I said I really got to know what's what's this boat going to cost and he said well it's going to be about seventy thousand but you remember Senor Alvaldo the guy that gave you the picture of the boat. He really wants to help. Hmm. So he's come down on his price from 120000 to 70000 Now look what happens. Between April, March of, of, when was it? Of, no, of October of 98, mm -hmm. when we first talked about the boat and he offered the boat 120000 all this. To April of 99, guess what happened? The dollar went up on the exchange rate. Oh. So the boat that was $110,000 in October, now in April and May of 99, is $40,000. Wow. So I called one of my trustees and I said, Alden, I said, what are we going to do? He said, let's go see the boat. Yeah. And so we went and uh, he checked it out. We saw how we could remodel the boat and, and do it. And I remember sitting in Senior Auto Valdo's office in, in Urucara where he lived and paid him the $40,000 for the boat and, and tell him, you know, Senior Advisor, we're going to be able to help people now that live along the rivers. We got the boat. But at that time we were renting a house from him for the preacher that lived in Udukara. Mm -hmm. Well, once you see God work, you, you know, you, you, you really get courageous. So I just said, Senior Advisor, I said, you know, we're going to help people. Enough. But I said, we're still paying rent on the house. Why don't you just give us a house too? He said, okay, you can have the house. Don't worry about paying rent anymore. <laughs> so we ended up getting the boat in the house for the preacher in, in Udukara. So we started our first trip in March of 2000. And we developed what is called Project Amazon Christ, Life, and Health. That's the name of, a, of the project. And we saw uh, kids that were two and three years old that had never seen a bar soap. Yeah. Uh, they ate the toothpaste. They had no idea. They had worms that would come out their neck, just yeah. full of worms. So our main medicine 
is a dewormer and vitamins. That's how we got started. And so everybody that comes on the boat now gets a dewormer uh -huh. and they get two months supply of vitamins. On each trip, we will distribute 30 to 40,000 vitamins. Wow. And last year we had uh, a lady that came that worked in a, in a drug store and she calculated the medicine at over the counter price mm -hmm. that we give out on every trip on the boat. It's between eight to $10,000 worth mm -hmm. of over the counter medicine that we distribute mm -hmm. the, the 10 or 11 trips we have each year. Mm -hmm. And it's, we can do that because of people in churches there in the States that help us that here in the States that collect vitamins and muscle rub and Vicks and all the medicine we use. And that's, that's, and they, when people go on their trips, they take two 50 pound suitcases of medicine and that's what we use on, on the boat. So that over the counter medicine starts with donations in the States. Exactly. That's the only way we could. Do it. I remember the bass is getting ready and we were doing, cause we'll, we'll yeah. talk about Jennifer and Jimmy in just a second, but it's, it's funny to know, okay, wow, all of this is full of over the counter medicine and it's going to help people specifically yeah. in the Amazon. Yeah. The only thing that we buy is the dewormer because we have to have plenty of that yeah. and it's more expensive. And then we have enough doctors on the trip Uh -huh. that's been on the trips that can provide antibiotics for us. So that kind of medicine we get from, from them too. But then as the time went by and, and we did this work, I, I didn't want to, the guys kept saying, you know, we need a, we need a better boat. We need a bigger boat and all this. Well, I wasn't really too excited. I guess my faith wasn't big enough to challenge a, a new boat, but we decided we we're going to, we're going to build another boat. And so in 2008 or nine, uh, we designed this boat and we built it from scratch. We bought three welding machines and the, the crew that was on the old boat uh, built it two and a half years to build the, the new boat. It costs almost between 800000 and a million dollars to build the boat, but we never owed a penny on it all the time we were building it. People provided, well, one of the ways they provided, we tried to get grants. We had a professional grant team that wrote grants like to Lilly and to Microsoft. We never got it, never got anything yeah. like Lilly. They said, well, how are you going to help us if we help you? Well, I was saying, well, we, we would call the boat Lady Lilly if you, <laughs> if you want, <laughs> if you want to help us that much, but we didn't. So. Well, you we can, develop. we can, we'll take your pharmaceuticals in the States, all of our people. <laughs> yeah. So we decided we would try to get a thousand people to give a thousand dollars over two years. And that would be the million dollars we needed to, to build the boat. Well, we probably had, I don't know, a hundred, 150 people do that, but we had churches that gave 50,000, uh, 10,000, 20 and, and helped. And we, we never owed anything. We built the boat. Yeah. without owing anything on it. But it was interesting because uh, when we would come back on furlough, we'd live with our daughter, who one of our daughters that live here in Springfield. Mm -hmm. And she has uh, one of her kids, Megan, is a down child. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever we would go to a church here close, Megan would, would hear me preach. And we were looking for these thousand people that would give a thousand dollars or and Megan had just gotten a job working at TAC and harsh, harsh people like her that she did a vocational school and she was able to, in fact, they, she sewed the lining for the Air Force planes here at Wright-Patterson. That was one of her jobs. And, and I remember her first, her first check when she came home and I think she'd made 86 cents or something like that. And she was so excited. She she had her job now and she was working, but during the year she got better and was, you know, well, at the end of the year at Christmas, we always meet at Kimmy's house and give out pajamas. And Megan said, grandpa, I want to give you the first president, first president. And she, she had done this without anybody knowing mm. she had saved $1,000 bills. She mm. said, I want one of those. It's going to help. And that's how we built the boat. Wow. People like that. People that sacrifice 
And, and that's the way we, we keep doing it today. I mean, and our, our, our goal now, you know, I always thought, always told people, you know, if, if God someday, I needed a boat to, to work in, God provide a boat. Well, now we're at the place where we almost need a hydroplane. Yeah. And, and I think God will provide that when we need it because our work is expanding and we need to get quicker to do our training for the Amazon missionaries. Yeah. And so, but that's how, that's how we go. And we do these, I'm scheduling trips now for 25. I saw that. We're all booked up. And, and usually when people would go, they'd want to come back and go in two years because that they had enough time to plan their vacation and, and uh, save the money they need. And went out, it's going to be almost every three years because we got mm -hmm. that many people want to come so, it's, so but it's interesting because people that come from the states they they make it happen yeah. you know they sacrifice their vacation the, the, the brazilians they don't understand they say these people even pay to go on a trip <laughs> i said yeah because that's the only way we can do it i mean there's no way we can operate unless they they give their in-country expense to help like on a on a trip we will use Eight thousand liters of diesel fuel just to operate the generators mm -hmm. in the boat. Yeah, I had a guy one time in the church. He said, "Well, maybe I can help fill the tank up one time." I said, "No, wait a minute. I said, to fill our tank up on our boat costs twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't think you want to spend twenty thousand oh. dollars, but we don't, we don't fill it up because we know how many liters we're going to need, how many gallons we're going to need for each trip. We know where we're going. We always keep a couple thousand extra in the tank. Yeah. So, but it's interesting to, you, you wonder sometimes, you know, I think is, is it really worth, am I doing this because I like it or am I doing it because God wants me to do it? You know, I'm having fun. And, and sometimes you think, well, a missionary shouldn't have fun, you know, he needs to suffer a little bit. Well, we have never, we have never really suffered, and and we're having fun. Yeah, and God is God is has blessed us. Usually, I work work as a translator for the doctor. You know, one of our trips a couple of years ago, uh, we have file cards on all the people that come on the boat, and so on one of these trips, this guy came in and he had a, a clean card. He had never been on the boat. Mm -hmm. And he came in the, in the doctor's office. He says, well, uh, I want to talk to Pastor Francisco. And I thought, oh, no, what happened now? And he said, well, I have never been on the boat, but I heard about it. And I wanted to come and see the people that are changing the lives of the people that live along the river. Mm -hmm. That's worth getting malaria. That's worth whatever the price you have to pay to see the people's lives are being changed. And I, and I preach this wherever we go, that where Jesus goes, everything gets better. Mm -hmm. Not just spiritually, but everything gets better. And we've seen that in, in the Amazon. I mean, no doubt about it. And that's what we preach. Project Amazon, Christ, life, and health. Mm -hmm. And we have never been turned down. When we get to a new village, and we have all, all kinds of new villages waiting for us, we have never been turned down and we let them know, you know, your life is going to get better. We got medicine, but our goal is for you to come to know Christ. And we have, we have places where we have service in the Catholic church building and they think I'm their priest. And I haven't told them I'm not. <laughs> I said, they're, they're interested in studying the Bible. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're interested in and changing their lives. So Earl, then go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we have another project now that we just a few years ago we took all of our our missionaries or our amazon missionaries that we're training down the river to visit a, a, a group in Sempadang, which is about halfway down the amazon to the atlantic and they have about 400 village churches mm. so they came on the boat and they give lectures and all that and one of their lectures was that they didn't pay their missionaries. And so that the guys that we helped, they got worried. They thought, well, Pastor Francisco, he's not going to give us any more help. And, and so I, I had a meeting with them, and I said, you know, you guys need to think about supplementing your salary. Do something that will help because we don't, we don't 
give my we we spend more for maintenance than we do for the, the little salaries that we give them. Mm-hmm. So one of our guys about six or seven years ago bought a piece of land, a jungle piece of land, started clearing it off. Well, now we have we have taken over that property and we have paid him what he what he paid for it. But we planted 500 graviola trees, which you don't know what a graviola is, and 500 kubwasu trees. Uh-huh. And we have we have already built a, a concentrated juice factory. Oh, wow. In one of these villages. Well, the graviola, the, the 500 trees, when it, and it'll, it should start producing this year or next year. Uh-huh. The 500 trees is going to produce... 15 ton of fruit the other the other kubwasu will produce eight ton of fruit so we are going to make that in the concentrated juice uh-huh. but then in that area where we where we got the farm now and it's it's growing farmers in that area had quit planting because they didn't have any place to sell their fruit well now they have a place to sell their fruit because we'll buy their fruit Mm-hmm. And we'll make it into concentrated juice where we can sell. And the 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 goal is this project might become the the finances for the Amazon work in the Amazon. Yeah. So it, it's amazing how God has worked. I mean, just yes. and you know, Ruth Ann and I are both. Well, I'll be eighty one next week, and she'll be eighty one in May. And we don't plan to stop. We're mm-hmm. gonna. We'll go as long as we can. The kids, like Teddy's on the trip now. Our youngest son is on the Amazon right now. How old's he now? Yeah. Teddy? Yeah. Would you ask how old? Yeah, how old? Well, he was born in 75. Okay, that's all I need to know. <laughs> oh. I should have looked at my note here. <laughs> <We're not laughs> that. But he's on the Amazon now. And then Michael, our other son, is going in April. Then I go back in May on a trip. Okay. And then I go... Again in June, stay for June and July trips, and then they're helping us because they speak Portuguese. But other a few years ago, because Ruth Ann had trained a Brazilian to take over the drugstore okay. because all the medicine is in in English that come, and so but she had trained somebody, and most of the doctors come are are have been English so far. Mm-hmm. So we 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 paid for a young lady to go to medical school. And she graduated last year, six years, and she did her first trip, last trip. When I was on the trip in February, she did her first trip, and she now is a Brazilian doctor on every, on almost every trip. She's doing uh, postgraduate work now, so she can't go on every trip. But that's her 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 goal. She went to Bible, went to went to medical school to become the doctor to work on the boat. So. And, I, and it's interesting because when she, she gave me the idea and she said, well, I passed the exam to get in, but we can't afford, we, there's no way we can pay $3,000 a month to go to medical school. I said, well, wait a minute. I've got some doctors that have been on the boat and I'm sure, well, out of the 20 medical people that had been on the boat to work during these 20 years, 15 of them gave $50 a month. Mm help pay her medical school and she went right through never they paid we paid most of it and they paid part of it and she she's she's the medical doctor now on the boat so earl there are so many takeaways gosh for our listeners and your stories because it's the the sheer mass scale of what you've been talking about is just incredible incredible for people to know of the 40 years and the 40,000 people that have come to Christ, the, all the, yeah, well now it, it's probably 50,000 now. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, and to go from the, the scale there in the cities, then now on the Amazon and to hear how it, 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 it what I take about you provide these big numbers and these big projects and these big discipleship networks, but yet you are able to tell these small stories of, of like your granddaughter, doing her part in making this big thing go go and it's yep. just it's, that's what the church is it's church is able to do your small work for a big task in jesus name and right um but i got a couple questions i want to kind of go back a little bit what okay. is really going in uh 
the city and now in the Amazon, what's the difference in the mindset of the Brazilian person? What's the, what's, what's the difference there? Well, the people that live like in Goiânia, yeah. in, the, in the big, they have no idea what it's like in the Amazon. It's, it's a different world. Yeah. The people live from, from meal to meal. In fact, we have developed a greenhouse mm-hmm. in São Sebastião. One of our projects mm-hmm. is to help them so they'll have a better diet because all they eat is fish and farinha. And farinha is made from manioc. It's like looks like sawdust. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's what's what what they eat. Mm-hmm. And life is completely different there. Once once you do a trip, your your priorities are going to change. You're gonna you're gonna see that you don't need all that you think you need, and you know. It's a, it's, it's a life-changing experience, and I, I guess that's the reason people come want to come back because they want to be a part of something that's like that. So, And it's super neat that, that your church, the churches in the city were, are making disciples themselves and are missions themselves. Like you said, you've got right. mission, Amer- or Brazilian missionaries in other countries than you have American missionaries around the world. And it's just neat to know that when something starts, God provides for a need. And then he reproduces that. And then it's so incredible to hear about the juice fact. I guess I'm going to call it the juice factory. Yeah, that's what we <laughs> and, call it. The juice and it, how, it's, how it's just reproducing some, and giving jobs and giving opportunities for people right. and paying yeah. for the work that God is doing. It just it reminds me, too, of how you're providing for a physical need. Is, and that's exactly how Jesus did his ministry. He would provide for a physical need in the terms of healing, that somebody needed something. And through that, a relationship was formed. And I, and you're, you see that every single day. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a couple, uh, well, a couple of experiences. We had one of our, we were at one of our, where we have one of our missionaries. We were there and visiting, treating them. And he said, now there's another village on back the back, back in the river here. Yeah. But those people are really funny. I don't think we ought to go there yet. Uh-huh. So they'd stopped, uh, at his village on their way back from town a couple of times and we treated them well they they didn't look at you they wouldn't look at you when you you tried to help them but finally they said why don't you come back to our village well that's what we wanted so uh, Gilberto, our missionary he led us back through the everglades to where they lived really poor 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 and this young lady little young girl came on the boat shed his little baby that was six months old and weighed six pounds and it was just like a raggedy Ann doll. She had no milk. She had no breast. They had no food in the village. So Ruth Ann fixed formula for her. And we thought, well, that's, you know, the least we can do is help her for a little while. But that little boy today is probably six years old. His arms and legs are like broomsticks. Mm-hmm. And he's ornery. He, he thinks he can get by with anything because <laughs> we've given special treatment. But that's, that's the kind of people that we've been able to help. We had a we had a young lady that that came on the boat that had twin girls, mm-hmm. and her mom would run her out of the house because she she'd become pregnant, and her mom didn't like it, and so she lived with another lady that worked on the boat for a while, and we had a couple that came and we helped buy them formula, helped this this young girl buy formula for the babies, mm-hmm. so then she ran out, and we didn't we didn't know this until we went back a few months later and had more formula but she had those two little babies had lived on sugar water sucking on the washcloth for a month and that's how she made she maintained to keep them alive by sucking on sugar water on a, using the washcloth put it in her mouth and they would suck on it but it's it's just yeah situations like that yeah, and you go to these people and and you tell them, you know, you know, you should get an X ray or should, you know, do some lab. We don't have a lab on the boat, and then you come back a few months later and you see on the card that the doctor recommended, and they look at you and they say, "Well, you're the only doctor we have. We don't we don't have anybody else. So you do what you can." Yeah, and I think it's been it's. It, a lot of people will be familiar with your stories at within the central family, but I, I think a lot of people, this will be news for them and, and th- their hearts will be made full. And I think like you, just like you said, once you see God work, you get a little courageous 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. And I think that's the power of testimony. And that's why we're encouraged to tell our testimonies because it encourages somebody else to do the same thing and get a little more courage to tell about what God is doing in their life. Yeah. So how has Central played a part? I know we've had, gosh, the a lot of uh, trips that have started. How did that initiation uh, with being a supportive church Church, you know, we I think we come every two years for a trip. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it goes back to an elder, Gail Coleman. Okay. I just spit those names out at 81, Pearl. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> he he had, he was an elder at the Maple Lawn Christian Church in Juliet, Illinois. Okay. And I remember he, he called, well, this goes back 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 in the seventies uh-huh. and he had seen my financial statement at the Lockport Christian church. Mm-hmm. And he said, anybody that, that can, that'll put out a, a, a statement like that, we, we need to support him. And so I went to the Juliet church and they started supporting us. Well, back in, it was in 74, we were there and we had bought a, a piece of piece of property to build a house on in Guayana because we weren't, we didn't want to rent anymore, but we needed $35,000. And so I thought, well, it doesn't cost anything. I'm going to go to talk to Gil. So I went over to the bank there in Juliet and I said, Gil, I need $35,000 to take to Brazil to build a house. He said, well, you'll never, you'll never get it. But he said, you know, most churches have mortgages. Why don't you get five churches to give $7,000 each and then you just make the payment on it. Well, within three weeks, we had more than what we needed. Mm-hmm. And so we were able to get the money we need to build our own house in Brazil. And we paid it off in 10 years. But that was an idea that he came up with. And I, I wrote an article for Christian Standard years ago. Sam Stone asked me to write. He said, you need to write an article about that. And so other missionaries have been able to do the same thing. It's the way a church can help without doing it being any expense to them. Yeah. See? And so in, instead of paying rent, we just made their payment every month yeah. on their loan. In fact, we had one of the one of the five loans what after we paid one one payment on their on their they got a, we got a letter from them say, well some some lady in the church had died and left us money and we're gonna pay your loan off. Don't worry about paying it. Hmm. So it was that was taken care of right right then. Well then Gil moved to Mount Vernon. Okay. And he said, we, you know, we need to get Hobbiters down here and we need to support them. So we, and that's been, that was back when, when the church was, yeah. well, the old church building. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the parsonage was there. I remember staying with, uh, what's his name? The preacher used to be there. Howard Craps. Yeah. I remember staying with them in their house there. But that's how it got started. And we would we would stay and then we'd stay with Gil and his wife until they died. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They've been dead a long time, but that's how we got started was Central. Yeah. Yeah, I remember being at Central when they ran two hundred people. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's it's I know we've got I think it's pro we've got a scheduled trip for Central that we're participating in in twenty three. I think that's or this year, right? Or next year. No, next year. I got it right here. Twenty four. I need to get my year straight. I, I'm, I'm 36 and I can't keep my years straight. <laughs> right here, March 11th through the 23rd, Mount Vernon. That's exciting. And I know uh, Jennifer and Jimmy have played a key role. All right, so Earl, what a t- I'm just amazed at every single story that you're able to say of how God has provided and how God has just worked in such a, a mass way in Brazil. And he's used you and, Ma- and Ruth Ann to do that. And so we're going to take a quick break, but we're going to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests on the Central Weekly to wrap up our conversation. How has God been working in your life lately? We'll be right back after this. And we're back with Earl Hobner from Brazil Central Mission, and we're going to ask him the question. Earl, are you ready? Here we go. How has God been working in your life lately? Well, it's been a year that's been a lot of changes. We have had to move from Brazil after 53 years to the United States Mm -hmm. because we're not young any longer. (laughs) And our kids thought it would be better to get a back here now and then we can continue to work in the amazon but we're doing it from here 
but we've had some health problems. Ruthann has had some back problems and had a heart issue when we, when we came back. So we've been treating that. But probably one of the, the greatest blessings and how God is using is using our kids to help us with the ministry in Brazil. So I don't, I, we don't have to go on every trip. They can go and they can, they can do what even better than what I can do. So we praise, praise the Lord for that. And the many, many people that are make possible our ministry. Yeah. Earl, you are a, um, it brings my heart a lot of good to hear your story. Um, you being 81, I'm 36. I've got young kids right now and praying into them and asking God to reveal things for their life and to know that, um, this is what can happen when people put their full faith and full life in God's hands. He can work so many wonders. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I tell people, don't be afraid to dream. Yeah. Don't be afraid to dream. God will, God will work something. It may not be what you think it's going to happen, but God will do something. Well, Earl, I thank you for your time. Um, this really, I think we just need to do a, uh, Earl Hobner podcast series where we just bring you in and let you talk for an hour <laughs> and then you could tell go one year at a time <laughs> but I'm fast I, I was amazed I was keep keep trying to keep track of all those dates and I was like you did a fantastic job with your timeline I'm impressed but you're a preacher at heart so that's it comes natural <laughs> well Earl I appreciate it and I look forward to uh the telling more about uh, what you're doing and uh, tell that to the central family on uh, I'm messing up. I always mess up the ends. <laughs> I'll edit that out too. <laughs> I'll do one more at exit. Re are you ready? Ready. Earl, thank you so much one more time for being on the central weekly. It really was a great time hearing how God is moving in your life. Thank you. And may central continue to be a blessing to us. Thanks Earl. And that's it for episode number 55 wow. of the Central Weekly. It's Gosh, the double nickel. Earl's so good, man. Earl Hobner. And you know, like that quote that you said um, yeah. at, the, at the front end that mm -hmm. Earl said in there about once you see God work, I just think it's really interesting how the sermon this weekend mm -hmm. and what Earl is talking about are really, I mean, like, boom, those two are, mm -hmm. are dead in line because... That verse 11 in John chapter 2, when Jesus had done this miracle at the wedding in Cana, this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. So he shows, like, they see him mm -hmm. do something, and the follow-up sentence is, and his disciples believed in him. So sometimes when you see Boom. God work, you want to do more. Boom. And let, I hope you guys do more. Follow God's lead and uh, share this episode with somebody that you need to hear this because these are words, not just empty words that we're just putting out there for nothing. And we want people to be inspired in their walk with Jesus and to make relationships matter. Next week, we're going to be looking at another missionary, and we're going to be looking at week number four of A Credible Count, Widow's Jar. Mm -hmm. John, I'll be there. Fill it up. You'll be there. Come on. Let's overflow. Nice. See you guys. <laughs>